welcome to Fantastic History. I'm Clay. I'm Sarah. We are a husband and wife duo who enjoy telling each other about amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history. And today is the last <gasps> part oh my God. in our series on the A to Z Guide to History's Great Panics. Oh, geez. We're using an infograph um, that goes through 26 panics, mass hysteria, mass delusion, etc., and we've I've added a couple of extra ones here and there, um, but it's been uh, it's been pretty interesting. It has, yeah. We've covered covered a lot of ground. Vampires, list, yeah, probably some other stuff. All sorts of monsters, all sorts of things. Uh, and this episode is no different. It's going to cover a lot of different types of of stuff. And there's only a few letters left. Four, if if I'm remembering right. Yeah, about about four. Yeah. Um, but we are going to fill this episode. Okay. No doubt. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Now, starting off this episode is a rather strange case that took place in Washington State in 1954. It began, it began in the town of Bellingham, north of Seattle, where people began to notice small pits in their windshields. Oh. They assumed the damage was done by vandal shooting BBs or something like that. Okay. And within a week... The, some residents of Mount Vernon and Cedra Woolley, 25 miles south of Bellingham, were reporting the same thing. Oh, my. The following week, towns further south, closer to the, to Seattle, began to notice the pits appearing in their windshields, too. Oh, you said this was 1954? Yeah. Okay. Now, police tried to find the vandals, but they had no luck. Um, and by this time, 2,000 cars had been reported damaged. Oh, my. And this epidemic was headed for Seattle. Uh-oh. On April 14th, newspapers in Seattle began running the story. And by that evening, it was clear that the pits had hit Seattle. Oh, no. Reports flooded in of vandalism. Parking lots and car dealerships had been hit. <gasps> Police cars were not even safe. <laughs> well, yeah. By the 15th, it was clear the problem had reached its height. Vandalism had been ruled out due to the sheer amount of cars affected. Oh, my. So there had to be another reason. Aliens. Well, possibly. You oh, never know. oh, my God. Okay. You know, you can't rule them out. <laughs> Yay. On Whidbey Island, right off the coast of Seattle, uh, Sheriff Tom Clark theorized that the damage could have been related to recent hydrogen bomb tests <gasps> in the south pacific oh that being in the southern hemisphere yeah uh, but he was not the only person to have a strange theory uh, military radio transmitters cosmic rays <laughs> even sand flea eggs laid in the glass <gasps> were proposed oh my god that'd be crazy yeah can you imagine i mean yeah that's nuts <laughs> but these are all rather absurd Scientists at the University of Washington were requested to investigate and performed a study on 84 cars on campus that had been damaged. They found the damage had been overly emphasized and were the result of normal driving conditions where small objects strike the windshield of your car. This, this, this is mm. common. This happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They also confirmed that a majority of the cars were pitted on the front and not the back. Oh, uh, Yeah. It was also determined that at the car dealerships that were affected, new cars were not pitted, but older cars were. Huh. In fact, almost all cars damaged were older cars. Indeed, the investigation concluded that the pits had been there the whole time. <laughs> and people were just beginning to notice them because, you know... <laughs> There's this epidemic going on. Better check your windshield. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, okay. You got it? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and two days later, reports of pitting incidents plummeted. You think? Yeah. 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 Okay. That's a fun, that's a fun story. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, I'm going to do another W. You are out of control. I love the power. It's it's corrupting me. It is. I can see it. Like your eyes are turning like all black. Yeah. Oh my god. Now, um, because there's another very famous mass panic that we we got to mention it. Okay. This one was indeed a panic as people freaked out, but it gets a little bit more credit than it deserves. I'm of course talking about the infamous 
1938 radio broadcast <gasps> of The War of the Worlds. Yay! By Orson Welles. Wonderful. Airing the night before Halloween on his Mercury Theater on the Air, the radio drama had been presented in part as a fake news bulletin, or other bulletins, Yeah, uh, to immerse the reader or the listener into the story. Perhaps too well. Even during the recording, police had entered the studio due to frantic calls from listeners who thought the alien invasion was real. Now, it's understandable how listeners who missed the beginning of the program could have been duped, Mm -hmm. fooled a little bit, beyond the absurdity of an alien invasion actually occurring. The play was presented brilliantly with musical acts being interrupted with breaking news. <laughs> so if you were just listening to the radio and it was just music uh-huh. and you heard an interruption, maybe you didn't know. Right. And the breaking news was of mysterious events involving meteors and explosions on Mars. And they started off rather inconspicuous. Like, here's some strange stuff that's happening, but we don't know what it is. And then it, uh, and then the music was cut off entirely as an alien emerged from a spaceship that had crashed on Earth. Oh, my. And here's some of the, uh, here, here's here's part of the script. Okay. okay. So just imagine, mm. it's 19, what was it, uh, 1938, mm-hmm. and you're sitting in front of your radio at okay. home. Okay, yep. And you hear this, good heavens, something's wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Ugh. Here's another, and another one, and another one. Mm-mm. They look like tentacles to me. I can see the thing has a body now. It's large. Large as a bear. It glistens like wet leather. But that face, it... Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. You know what, That It makes me think of um, the shit weasels from uh, Stephen King's Dreamcatcher. Oh. That's what I was picturing, like the gray okay. skin, the kind of tentacles, yeah. like wet looking. That's what it made me think I of. I was sort of thinking of the uh, creature from Prometheus. Okay. Just, just can't really describe it. It's sp- yeah. super spooky. <clears throat> but the show went on to describe catastrophic destruction of the country, poisonous gas releasing into neighborhoods, UFOs landing in Chicago and St. Louis, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So the announcer detailing all this horror and death and annihilation. And some people were either very terrified or very gullible. <laughs> and, they, and they bought it. Yeah. The following day, newspapers across the country were running the story on the front pages. There was widespread outrage as millions had fled their homes or prayed for survival in their basement. Or at least that's what the sensationalist media had claimed. Uh huh. In reality, there were many... Complaints filed, but the actual number of people who were legitimately duped into a panic were relatively low. Yeah. Wells held a press conference on Halloween and apologized, insisting he had not intended to fool anyone on purpose. However, he would later go on to embrace the story and it added a bit of mystique to his character. Well, yeah, anybody would, I think. Yeah. So, it's a famous case. It's it's often referenced every time, but... It really wasn't it, quite as big of a deal yeah. in reality, but it got played up quite a bit, and it's pretty fun. That was something I remember my creative writing teacher in high school being just outraged that people still believed there had been mass panic because <laughs> of War of the Worlds. And I don't remember. She must have been teaching it, and maybe that's why it came up. Um, I apologize to Dr. Everson because I've certainly never read it or watched any of the movies or listened to the broadcast so uh if that was an assignment sorry about that i've I've faked my (laughs) way through it but i just i remember her being so angry because that did not happen like (laughs) okay barbara jean it's all right settle down it's a little bit easier for us in today today to think back even to the 30s as people just being dim-witted and easily oh yeah duped by things but in reality yeah People nowadays are probably much more gullible to fall for something like that than they were back then. A thousand percent. Yes, absolutely. So, Sarah, we have talked about a lot of weird stuff in this series. On this show, really. Yeah, well, vampires, curses, satanic influences, monkey men, and cat nuns. <laughs> cat nuns. But it's finally time to talk about the big one. We're on to the letter X. 
So it's time we talk about the X Files. <laughs> oh, I didn't think you were really going to say that. I'm so excited. Oh yeah, <gasps> the extraterrestrials, Ooh. the little green men. Ooh. X is for Z- uh, xenology amateurs. Oh boy! And there's just so much to say about aliens. <laughs> the History Channel confirm- confirms that they've been with us for thousands of years. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, let's take their word for it. Well, they're the History Channel. Okay. They got some authority. Uh-huh. Yeah. But them I want... and Chum Lee both. <laughs> but, uh, but I want to talk about uh, modern UFOs. Okay. And the modern era of alien encounters started all the way back in 1947 when a pilot named Kenneth Arnold claimed that he saw nine unidentified flying objects while flying near Mount Rainier in Washington. His UFOs were moving in a diamond formation Ugh. at a speed of over 1700 miles per hour oh my god and his descriptions of them brought the term flying saucer into <gasps> the american lexicon oh hell yeah kenneth now arnold was not a nut job he was an experienced pilot and in the idaho search and rescue but after the air force concluded that what he what he saw must have been some mirage or mm. misidentification or something like this He concluded to the press that his flying saucers were not of planet Earth. Get him, Kenneth. (coughs) Show him what's what. Now, (laughs) now before Arnold's flying saucers, alien activity was much more variable. Reports of strange sightings had been documented since as far back as um, 1440 BCE. Oh, my. Where Thero, and I'm going to mispronounce it, so everyone just get ready. (laughs) Thutmose. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's how it. That's how it appears. Sure. Um, uh, he reported seeing fiery discs floating in the sky. More recently, in the 16th century, people in Nuremberg and Basel, Switzerland, reported seeing the skies fill with spherical objects coming out of the sun at different times. Oh dear. Much more recently, during World War II, uh, while al- Allied pilots were conducting flights over the European and Pacific theaters. Many claim to witness mysterious aerial phenomena and UFOs. These encounters and sightings were lumped together into one term, a Foo Fighter. (gasps) Oh my god. I'm blowing your mind. Yay! (laughs) Oh, I'm so happy. Then on February 24th, 1942, the infamous Battle of Los Angeles occurred. Hey, that's two bands in a row. First you got the Foo Fighters, now you got Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> Hell yeah, this is my favorite. <laughs> now this was a false flat, a false attack on L.A. three months after the U.S. had entered World War II. And one day after a Japanese sub attack on Elwood near Santa Barbara. So fears were of another uh, Japanese attack on American soil were pretty high. Anti-air shells were fired in the early morning hours over the city, causing mass chaos, which Oof. killed five people. Oh, my. But there was no attack. The alarm seemed to have been raised over a misidentified meteorological balloon. However, it had also been attributed to a UFO sighting well, yeah. that caused the mass panic. And it wouldn't be the first time that a weather balloon was misidentified as an alien spacecraft, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Okay. But over all the years centuries, millenniums of UFO sightings, rarely is the description of a saucer. But after 1947, saucers were the vehicle of choice. Oh, yeah. Arnold saw his saucers on (laughs) June 24th, and America went crazy. Hell yeah. His story was published all across the country, and immediately sightings began to pour in from all over. Over 800 copycat sightings were reported in subsequent weeks. (laughs) Oh, Okay, then. And they almo- I'm sure those were all legitimate. <laughs> and they all described flying saucers or disks. And this peaked on uh, July 7th. Mm. But even the lieutenant governor of Idaho publicly announced that he had witnessed a flying saucer. Huh. The man, he just goes out and says it. In okay. public. The crew of a uh, United Airlines Flight 105 out of Boise reported seeing several UFOs during a flight on July 4th. Can you imagine being on an airplane and seeing a UFO? I know. I would never stop screaming, ever. (laughs) 
Now, this event was also widely publicized, further adding fuel to the na national hysteria. Mm -hmm. Sightings of flying saucers had been reported in 48 states by July 9th. Chimney. And theories, explanations, and hoaxes had run amok. From cosmic illusions to <laughs> weather balloons and birds to Martians, Soviet weapons, and the sign of the end times. <laughs> Everything was being thrown out. <laughs> uh -huh. And finally, by July 10th, reports had lowered to a mere trickle. Uh -huh. A few sightings here and there and a few more hoaxes here and there, but the national panic and headline news had finally died down. The 1947 flying disc craze was largely blamed on mass hysteria. It started all by that sighting by Kenneth Arnold. As for what Arnold actually saw, there are no solid explanations. But that begs the question, why did this story capture American paranoia so strongly? Because, you know, there have been sightings all over the place for, for many years, but this one took off. Uh, it was so effective that it defined pop culture for the following decades, and still today. Oh, I was going to say. Now, a big reason may just be stress, because a few months earlier marked the beginning of the Cold War oh, between yeah. the U.S. and the USSR. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of months earlier, or sorry, a couple of years earlier, saw the end of World War II using the most devastating and horrific weapon ever made, the atomic bomb. Right, yeah. Mankind had created a weapon more destructive than anything thought possible before, and the Soviets were working on their own. So stress was high. Paranoia was high. It was a perfect petri dish for mass panic over something unknown and terrifying. Now, before we end this entry, I want to mention one more event that took place during these two and a half weeks of panic. Okay. An event that received very little attention at the time because it was during this panic. I mean, th there were things happening everywhere. Yeah. But it would later become the biggest thing to happen to aliens and those who love them. Is that Roswell? A balloon landed in Roswell, New Mexico. <laughs> Now, this would have likely been, ended up being a, barely a footnote of the 1947 panic like like the rest of them. If it was not for one doofus <laughs> at the Fort Worth Army Airfield who issued a press release stating that they had recovered an, a flying disc. <gasps> Man. And his name was Tom DeLong. Is it? No, honey, but he's so into <laughs> aliens. Like, he is so into aliens. You don't even know how into aliens Tom DeLonge is. Okay. But we've got the Foo Fighters. We've got Rage Against the Machine. Why not bring Blink-182 into this, you know? Uh, okay, fair enough. Yeah. The Roswell incident would remain dormant while aliens took over popular culture in the American zeitgeist from the 50s up to our present day. Then in the late 70s, it popped up again after Major Jesse Marcel gave an interview where he stated to UFO researchers, UFO researchers, mm -hmm. and the National Enquirer that he had helped transport the debris to Fort Worth and claimed that it was extraterrestrial. Ooh. And from there, the story took on a life of its own. And now Roswell is where little green men crash their spaceship. In 1997, the U.S. military conducted, uh, concluded that the debris fr was from a weather balloon from Project Mogul. Sure, which was Jan. a big weather balloon project, top secret to monitor Soviet nuclear testing. Mm -hmm. But a more reliable source tells a different story. Commander William Riker himself. <gasps> what? Yes. What? Jonathan Frakes hosted a little found footage movie in 1995 called Alien Autopsy. Hell yeah! Which purportedly showed authentic footage of an alien from the Roswell crash. Oh, Riker! What a hero. And it was available to purchase right on your television. Oh my god. It caused a media spectacle, but was the last squeezing of the juice of that original 1947 craze. Mm-hmm. Today, now that everyone has a high-quality camera in their pocket, UFO sightings have plummeted, and I, I can't tell you why. Well, I will say, for what it's worth, you know, Tom DeLonge founded something called, I want to say it's To The Stars Academy, and they are spending, like, tons of money and, you know, getting... I have not looked into it because, you know, Tom and I have beef, um, but... Apparently, they've gotten, you know, quite a lot. From what I've heard from uh, our friends over at the Chiluminati podcast, uh -huh. um, they've gotten quite a bit of 
quote unquote evidence okay with you know modern technology and stuff again haven't looked into it um i'm always imagine it being kind of in the vein of zach bagans getting evidence yeah it's kind of exactly what i'm picturing um but i don't i'm just saying i'm just saying there's stuff out there we could look at well i'll look forward to seeing their nobel prize <laughs> If anybody is going to win a Nobel Prize, it's not going to be Tom DeLonge from Blink-182. Hey, if he's the one who discovers and confirms that aliens are here, then he should. That's Yeah, I guess so. Now, this next entry is also a big one, because it may be the only entry on our entire list that, while it caused a panic and spiraled out of control in its climax, the problem was real and legitimate. Oh, it all started a long time ago. In a galaxy far, far away. No, in this galaxy right here. Oh, damn. All the way back in 1958, a man named Bob Bimmer noticed a problem. He was a computer programmer working at IBM. Oh, my God. But in his work, he saw a shadow of a catastrophe. Back in the 50s and 60s, computer programming was very different, and programmers had limited space to write their code. <laughs> <laughs> you can see where this is going i was so happy right now <laughs> i am going to cry okay <laughs> continue they had limited space to write their code so shortcuts were developed to use as little space as necessary for more common data <laughs> such as the year <laughs> instead of writing 1971 for instance just write 71 <laughs> What's the problem? What's going to happen? Well, you know what's going to happen. What happens when it's 1999? Yeah. Oh, no. Why is for the Y2K bug. Woo! Woo Woo-woo! Give it up for my homegirl, Y2K. I remember her (laughs) fondly. It's the millennium, y'all. Oh! The problem that uh, Bemmer saw boils down to that two-digit code. When on January 1st, 2000, computers would assume that the date had rolled over to January 1st, 1900. (laughs) So stupid. Bemmer's warnings were not taken very seriously for a while because cases of where multiple millennia were used in programming were not common. And people thought the issue would be resolved by the new millennium. Mm -hmm. And their reasoning was half right. Computers would become more widespread and storage would become a lot cheaper. The limitations of the time would certainly be solved before this problem came to fruition. What they did not anticipate is how slow to change companies and governments would be, (laughs) opting for tried and true legacy systems instead of expensive upgrades. Doesn't that just sound like a businessman or a government to you? Oh, yes. You know. Hey, if it ain't broke, why fix it? People are people. They're going to do the same shit they've always done. Indeed, and even today, much of our government's computer systems are running on severely outdated hardware. (laughs) What was known as the Century Date Problem regained some new attention in a 1984 book called Computers in Crisis, which outlined what the specific problems could be and how to resolve them. For instance, Zara. Okay. If a 15-year mortgage begins in 1986, the computer systems may show that the end date of the loan is in 1901. Instead of 2001. Okay. Resulting in a lot of errors because that took place in the past. Right. Or a credit card not expiring until the year 2000, but already expired in the year 1900. Ah. So this was going to be a big problem for a lot of people. Although, to be fair, back in 1999, we were still mostly using the chunk chunk thing (laughs) for credit cards. You know the one. I do. So... I'm just saying. That would have been fine. Yeah, that that, that might have worked. By the mid-90s, the problem has still not been solved. But the world was a very different place. I'll say. Home computers were becoming much more uh, common due to affordability. People were beginning to log into this new thing called the internet. Oh, God. The year 2000 was on the horizon. It was a decade of optimism, excitement, and abject terror. <laughs> the world was changing fast, and what would this new cyber world be like? Well, with change comes fear, and that is where the Millennium Bug fit right in. As the decade moved on, people were beginning to see a term pop up in computer magazines, then in newspapers, then on TV. 
Y2K. Oh, God. I just got chills. I'm <laughs> so happy. Oh, the 90s. I miss you so much. The zippy name became the name of the century date problem in pop culture. Media began to fill with experts explaining that the Y2K, what the Y2K problem was and what it could do. Remember those legacy systems we were talking about? Mm-hmm. Well, they reported that those vulnerable computers ran just about everything from traffic <laughs> infrastructure to banking, from oil refineries to missile silos. And uh, airplanes as well, if I'm remembering. Like yeah. People were worried about planes falling out of the sky. If it ran on a computer. <clears throat> It, it could, or if it ran on electricity, even yeah, it'd be at risk. <sighs> and if these computers were all at risk, come January first, two thousand, there could be widespread disaster. Planes could fall out of the sky, as you, you said. See, banks shut down, missiles could fire on their own, and so on. <laughs> the public panic of Y two K finally forced computer and software developers to deal with the problem that they were putting off for so long. And make their projects Y2K compliant. Yes. That was the must-have feature on any computer. And honestly, anything at all that plugged into a wall could be labeled Y2K compliant to ease the consumer's mind. There's an incredible episode of King of the Hill about this. If you have not uh, seen Hillenium recently, definitely worth going back to watch. Yes, it's a product of its time. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Companies frantically tried to get their systems compliant, but in doing so, basically at the last minute, it was expensive. It is estimated that the U.S. spent over $300 billion (gasps) preparing for Y2K. Oh, my God. (laughs) Meanwhile, many people began to stock food and water in their basements. (laughs) My do. (laughs) Fearing that um, credit card systems and banks would go down. And I know that my family... Put away a little bit of food. Really? In our basement. Your mom still has a lot of canned food in her basement. <laughs> I'm going to be real honest. She does. I've seen it. You never know. Is that leftover from Y2K? It may be. <laughs> that may be 23-year-old mac and cheese down there. Oh, God. Uh, they'd still be using the good recipe, though, so I don't know. <laughs> mac and cheese used to be much better back in the 90s. Hey, listen. What did we know? It was the 90s. <laughs> and, of course, fundamentalist religions. mm um, cults, survivalists, all these yeah. folks declared Y2K was going to be the end of the world, the apocalypse, or the second coming. We could be so lucky. On December 31st, 1999, the world partied like it was, well, 1999. <laughs> Midnight came and went, and no planes fell out of the sky. The apocalypse had been canceled, and Y2K <laughs> seemed to be a bust. Pundits were quick to call the whole panic a mass hysteria, a big waste of time and energy, and (laughs) fear-mongering by the media, and a big cash grab by software developers. Uh Uh-huh. But was it overblown hysteria, or was the problem real that was adverted due to the panic? Well, I mean, you just said they put $300 billion just in the United States, right, towards fixing it? So you don't know... That it was a hoax or a panic because maybe $300 billion fixed the problem. That's basically it. <sighs> and the, and honestly, the answer to that question, it, it, it was a bit of both because while it was overhyped to the point of ridiculousness and fear mongering, I mean, mm-hmm. does your toaster need to be Y2K compliant? <laughs> well, maybe. What if, you can't, what if you wake up in the morning and you can't make toast? Yeah. They haven't invented sliced bread yet in 1900. (laughs) So what are we going to do? The toaster's not going to know what to do. Yeah, the computer's going to come up and see that it hadn't been invented yet and delete itself. Exactly. But the Y2K problem, it was real. And it would have caused some problems both large and small had it not been fixed. But those problems probably would not have caused the end of the world, for instance. (laughs) You would hope not. Now, there there were actually some issues that did occur on January 1st. 2000 but as i said they were small Mm -hmm. they were not major one that i as i was doing research i was listening to a video by lgr and he mentioned one uh very funny and also a sign of its time error that occurred where a guy um had rented a videotape (gasps) before oh he he rented it in 1999 Uh and then went to return it in the year 2000 but the computer system thought that it was a hundred years past due. 
because it's just a computer system. It doesn't know what it's doing. Blockbuster was not worried about BMY2K compliant. They didn't give a shit. No, it doesn't matter. We just sell videotapes. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> yeah. So there are things like that where like <laughs> some systems were dis- displaying the wrong date or things weren't working because it, because the error was um because of the error that, that was occurring with the date. But overall, it wasn't the it wasn't the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. The upgrades actually had benefits beyond Y two K. The upgrades made to New York City's infrastructure actually proved invaluable after the 9-11 attacks. Wow. Where redundancies in the system helped the city's telecommunications stay up and help first responders. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's amazing. So while Y2K is looked back on as kind of a joke now, it's a unique case where because disaster did not strike, people called it an unnecessary panic. But if no one had raised the alarm... People would have been asking why it wasn't made a bigger deal of at the time. Oh, my God. Sort of a catch-22. Yeah. But I knew you were going to love Oh yeah, talking about Y2K. Oh, yeah. The 90s is is the love of my life. I'm sorry, honey. Um, <laughs> but you already know that. Like, I just... The, oh, wonderful. Do you remember where you were uh, when it rolled over? Yeah. Where you were New Year's Eve? I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember I was... Uh, so this is like it's wonderfully '90s, and I have a picture <laughs> of it somewhere. It's just, if it's if I can find it, I'll actually put it on our Instagram. It's humiliating, but uh, I was with three of my girlfriends who lived in the same neighborhood as me, and uh, we were just gonna like walk around the neighborhood because it was like, well, if everything goes down, we'll be outside, we'll be fine, right? Like, oh right, right, like just an, on the off chance that you know this is the end of the world, you know, we we'll, we should be fine. And I was wearing um, flare leg jeans, oh, like no. not just boot cut but we're talking like this was a borderline bell-bottom jean mm-hmm. um sketchers with really thick soles obviously um a white tommy hill figure t-shirt and a black puffy vest and i had those little butterfly clips in my hair wow yep you couldn't <laughs> tell me shit i was dressed for it baby i was ready for the millennium you were ready for the end of the world <laughs> yes i was well, that's wonderful thank you so much <laughs> And now we come to the final entry. We've talked about a lot of different types of panic and cases of mass hysteria and delusion. And while we have covered several cases of religious moral panics, we have not talked about religious mass delusions. Okay. A.K.A. miracles. Oh. We've heard them all before. Statue of the Virgin Mary Christ tears in front of spectators. Happened on Dairy Girls. Or statues of uh, Ganesha drinking milk offerings from visitors. Wow. Or the image of Jesus appearing on your piece of toast. (laughs) And then you turn around and sell it on eBay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for entry Z, we're talking about the appearance of the Virgin Mary at Zeitung. Okay. This occurred on the night of April 2nd, 1968 in the Zaitan district of Cairo, Egypt. Muslim mechanics were the first to claim witnessing something strange on the roof of St. Mary's Coptic Church. Interesting. It appeared to be a woman, and they were afraid that she was up there to commit suicide. Yeah. However, the illuminated figure did not leap, and a small crowd formed around to watch the strange event. Then one person said that it looked like the Virgin Mary. And this event only lasted a few minutes before the apparition disappeared, but a week later she reappeared. This irregular reappearance continued for the next three years. Oh my God. And was seen by approximately 250,000 people of various races, ethnicities, and religions. Oh my God. And we do have photographs of the apparition. Oh dear. But very few. You'd expect to see a ton of of pictures from this event, um, especially at the time. Okay, I'm going to Google it. I want to see this. I can show you them. Oh, okay. Oh, what the fuck? Let's see. Oh, my. That is much clearer than I expected it to be. What? What is that? Okay. Oh. Uh, you got it? Mm-hmm. I'll be seeing that in my nightmares. <laughs> well, and, and you would expect these photos to be authentic as well but it it looks like a composite to me and i can see that too 
but I, it's just the fact of, even if the photo itself is not real and the photo is a composite, I'm assuming it must be very close to what thousands of people actually saw. Well, what they claim to have seen. Right. But the pictures are, um, they vary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, I, there's and, like a couple different angles I saw on there. Yeah. The appearance was also never witnessed by someone on the roof, only people on the ground. Right. Where apparently it would get quite rowdy and stampedes would lead to some deaths. Oh, no. Forcing police to con- control the eager crowds. Oh, God. Some explanations have been proposed, and the explanation that this infographic chooses is that the light was caused by seismic activity. For three years, though? Yeah, but, yeah, earthquake lights, as it's also known. Now, earthquake lights have never been proven. Mm -hmm. They've been theorized. Kind of like ball lightning we talked about. And what was that, Lonnie Zamora? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly like that. They've been reported. They haven't been proven. A lot of people think they don't exist or they are misattributed to other things, like Mm. Like an earthquake happens and it causes a transformer to blow up. Right. Or there's a there's like a flash of lightning and that's attributed to it. But the, the actual seismic activity is not causing light itself. Okay. Uh, but as you said, this would not explain a direct bright light appearing in one specific spot for multiple times over the course of three years. Right. Now, Cynthia Nelson was a professor of anthropology at the American University in Cairo. She is one of the few secular witnesses of the event. And when she heard about the apparition, she did a little investigation of her own. Get them, Cynthia. Uh, She herself witnessed the light, but she described it as more of like a a headlight flashing Uh. and interviewed other witnesses. Her 1973 paper, The Virgin of Zaitun, uh, does not provide an explanation for the source of the light. Mm -hmm. And... um, but acknowledges that once people were expecting to see the Virgin Mary, that's what they saw. Right, of course. And a large reason as to why they would be so apt of accepting a flashing light as a Marian tra- transfiguration is, one, Egypt had just been defeated in the Six-Day War the previous year, mm. and it created a feeling of crisis and wavering faith in the country. Right. And two, that's just how mass delusion works. Yeah. I heard an interview with one person who said the apparition specifically looked down at him and smiled (gasps) at him. Oh, my God. Now, perhaps that's what that is what he thinks he saw. But when taking into account the other witnesses and photographs, it just comes across as a man seeing something strange and his mind filling in what he wanted to see. Right. And those pictures are terrible. Yeah. Photography even back then was much better. It yeah. was not, it, it, it was, it, that looked like it was taken in the 1800s. Right. And there are, there are only like five pictures mm. over the course of three years. And Sarah, that concludes the A to Z Guide to History's Great Panics. Wow. Round of applause. You did such a great job. Thank you. This has been some of my favorite episodes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's easy when you when you jump back and forth between <laughs> different different subjects. It keeps things interesting, mm-hmm. and we might do stuff like this in the future. I definitely enjoy doing my presidents episode. Little yeah. listicle episodes are fun. Yeah, and I hope you enjoyed this different format and found the stories to be interesting and entertaining. And if you did, please take a second to rate, review, and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use. Check us out on Twitter and Instagram for more content. We are Fantastic H Pod on both. Or shoot us an email. We are Fantastic at gmail.com. And we also have those Fantastic History stickers available for sale on Etsy. Link is in the show notes. We'll be back next week. See you then. Bye bye.